Now specifically in the foot and ankle, I wanted to look at the flat foot, which we published some literature on, syndesmotic injuries, which is coming out soon, and then weight-bearing alignment for arthritic cases. So this was just published in uh, JBJS, and if you're interested in this, you should look at the article. This was uh, led by Cesar, Cesar Donetto, who is a, uh, one of our future uh, fellows. He was a research fellow with me. And he's now at Special Surgery doing his fellowship and will be joining us next year. Uh, he put a tremendous amount of work into quantifying what is the flat foot. What are the angles that we need to look at in a three-dimensional system? Because most of the time we're looking at drawing lines on a two-dimensional representation of the three-dimensional structure, the weight-bearing x-rays. And that's the standard that we've evaluated for our pre-op and post-operative cases. But now we're going to have this three-dimensional information. We have to determine what the axes are that we will use reproducibly to determine the features of that flat foot. So here you see non-weight-bearing versus weight-bearing, the talonavicular uncoverage. This is one of the things we look at on the x-ray. But here you can see very nicely we have very specifically identified the talus first metatarsal angle, and we could see the altered angle, non-weight-bearing versus weight-bearing. Talonavicular coverage, another common thing that we look at on the CAT scans, where now, on the x-rays, we now can look at on the CAT scans in a three-dimensional format. Four-foot arch angle, looking at the angle of the arch relative to the floor non-weight-bearing versus weight-bearing. You see it's lowered down, consistent with a flat foot. The arch height, the navicular to skin distance, drop down again with the weight-bearing. Navicular to floor distance, drop down with the weight-bearing. Uh, also, medial cuneiform to skin, medial cuneiform to floor, all drop down with the weight-bearing CT, all reproducible measurements. And not only did we look at that, we also looked at whether it was reliable as well as reproducible. So many different visits to these images by many different observers will come up with consistent numbers. Also, you can see in the flat foot, the calcaneal fibular distance here, non-weight bearing, you see a little gap there. And when you look at the weight bearing, you see that's closed down, the calcaneus is sitting higher or the fibula is sitting lower, and you have a, quite a change in the morphology of that flat foot. More angles talus first metatarsal angle, navicular to skin distance, and uh, medial cuneiform, and so on and so forth. These, all these standard ways to look at a flat foot have been codified to be reproducible uh, and reliable measurements of looking at the flat foot with the weight-bearing CAT scan. Uh, we also can look at the subtalar horizontal angle and again determine exactly where the deformity is occurring and where you could reproducibly measure it. Uh, as I mentioned, we looked at the reliability of these measurements, looking at people of different skill level and, and having them do the, the measurements. We also looked at a comparison of what we see clinically and what we uh, know is happening on the CAT scan. So you can see here the clinical alignment, and this is the clinical alignment on a weight-bearing CAT scan, and then we peel away the tissues and we go look at the Achilles to calcaneal tuberosity line, which is perhaps a better way to more objectively assess what the angle is. But even more objectively is just to look purely at the bony alignment and to determine what the axis of that foot is. How much valgus is there is probably most directly reproducible with this, act, this alignment technique versus the clinical alignment. But this helps me to calibrate so when I look at this and I say, okay, that's 15 degrees, and I get a weight-bearing CAT scan, I say, okay, that's 16 degrees, okay, I'm pretty close. Um, and we could do this uh, over and over again in the clinic, and I, I think it makes us better clinicians. And here you could see an example of one where we have a more severe uh, malalignment. Again, several different ways to, to do the measurement. Which one seems to correlate best with the clinical alignment uh, that's uh, probably the tibial uh, axis of Taylor joint angle uh, with 90% uh, intra-observer um, and 0.79 uh, intra-observer reliability. Uh, also looking at which uh, clinical alignment 
uh, which, which correlates best with what we see on clinical alignment. You can see the different measurements. That doesn't mean these measurements are bad. It just means that these are maybe what we should be focusing on versus the clinical alignment. What is more reproducible ultimately is going to be better.